Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Longmore House under the Year of History, Heritage and Archaeology. First, before we get started, for our um, visitors to Longmore, and I should say also welcome to our viewers on Facebook this evening because we are live on Facebook tonight, looking at our two speakers and hoping they're ready for that. But for our visitors into the building this evening, just a couple of bits of housekeeping first. So we're not expecting a fire alarm this evening, but if we do have one, if you'd all like to proceed in an orderly fashion through the double doors, back the way you came, and the muster point is just in front of the library across the road. And I hope everybody's just found the loose, but they're straight the way across the corridor, and we have a fantastic team of people this evening here to keep you right if anybody does get lost. Right, as part of the Year of History, Heritage and Archaeology, Historic Environment Scotland are presenting a series of lectures which will tell Scotland's story from the deep, deepest past to the present day. The purpose of this series is to, is to share and celebrate the wealth of knowledge within our organisation and to give people a chance to learn about the archaeology and history of Scotland. So we've reached November and this is the 11th lecture in our series, so we're coming close to the end of the year now. And this, um, this evening is all going to be about the age of war. So we have two fantastic speakers for you this evening who will be discussing military remains on land and on sea, in sea respectively. So first up, we have Alan Kilpatrick, who's a data and recording officer and an expert in military archaeology. And his talk will present the results of recent and ongoing archaeological survey work by Historic Environment Scotland to record and understand the network of defences which were constructed to protect the Clyde. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alan. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, my talk is going to be on, I've, I've, I've entitled it Fortress Clyde, uh, it's not a term that was probably in use, but what I'm going to discuss tonight is really what um, the survey and recording section of Historic Environment Scotland have been doing over the past couple of years in and around the Clyde area. Uh, we have one project which we've finished, the Defence of the Clyde, which is really looking at the coastal gun emplacements, uh, and then the second project, which is actually ongoing, and we have a team in the field this week recording the remains, uh, looking at the aerial defences of the Clyde, so really Second World War. But before I get into the, the meat of the, the talk, um, I just want to tell you about the resource that we have. Many of you have probably used Canmore, uh, but you may not have delved deeply and worked out how many military sites from the 20th century there are in the country. And if I just put onto the first slide, each one of these dots is a site in Canmore, which you can look at and view uh, from the comfort of your own uh, computer. And there are 3,500 dots on this map, which is a, a tremendous number of sites right across Scotland. Concentrating, uh, obviously, on the East Coast, maybe, with airfields and coastal defences, but even into the Highlands as well. It's a huge resource, and I've not even put on the maritime information, which my colleague Philip will deal with uh, in the second half of tonight's uh, lecture. So, uh, without any further ado, let's talk about the Clyde uh, and the Lower Clyde and the gun batteries on the Clyde. In about uh, 19, about the late the turn of the 1900s, there was a government commission which uh, established that they, they needed to have many more uh, protected ports. And so the grand scheme was launched all around uh, the country, uh, like the Forth and also here in the Clyde. New batteries, new gun batteries were put in place. Uh, and there were three uh, built, uh, but there was also another one planned at Clock point just here. Uh, the land was bought at a vast sum apparently uh, and they decided they didn't want to use it and sold it for a very small amount of money back to the original owner. Anyway, so we start off. Fort Matilda is actually a fort that was first built in 1815 but was re-engineered in 1901 to take modern guns. So it fundamentally changed. Port Kill also built, started building in 1901, finished about 1904, and it comprised uh, two six-inch guns and two 4.7-inch guns. Uh, Fort Matilda had two 4.7-inch guns. And then Ard Hallow, south of Danoon, uh, and it had one 9.2-inch uh, gun, that's a, a really meaty gun, and two six-inch guns. So it was quite, um, it was quite a formidable defence. However, by 1916, 1915 they actually made the decision, by 1917 the plan has somewhat changed. Fort Matilda is no longer active and has been disbanded. 
the guns at Port Kill, the two, gun, two sections guns have been removed to clock, funnily enough, which was bought at vast expense uh, <laughs> in 1915. So uh, two sections guns are moved to clock, and then at Ard Hallow, uh, it's just two sections guns. Uh, when they test fired the battery in 1905, they discovered that uh, when they fired the guns, in particular the 9.2, it blew out all the windows in the adjoining village. Uh, and consequently, uh, they actually, this, the, the 9.2 was removed in 1911. So it was just two sections guns. Uh, to get round the problem of the broken windows, they bought all the houses in the village. So yeah, there's, there's no messing with this lot. No, really However, by 1940, things have changed once more. Port Kill, the guns are removed actually in 1927. Uh, Ard Hallow and Clough still there. There's a small gun, a 12 pounder established actually on the castle at D uh, Danoon. If you go to the castle, you can see a concrete foundation. It's not where the gun actually stood, but it's part of the the infrastructure associated with the gun, and a new battery down here at Towered Point, which was built to provide protection, the outer protection, but also to the uh, examination anchorage at uh, Rothsey. So let's have a look at some of these sites in more detail. First of all, Fort Matilda, Not, there is nothing left of the structure. Uh, in the 60s, this large government uh, office was built, uh, laterally the Coast Guard, uh, and that, unfortunately, has been recently demolished, along with the Victorian submarine depot, which uh, uh, mining depot, which actually uh, was part of a system of laying mines across between Fort Matilda and Port Kill. All that has now been removed and is now uh, uh, being built on for housing, but the boundary walls have been kept, and so we have the War Office boundary stones still extant in the, uh, in the walls. But that's it, for, uh, sadly, for Fort Matilda. Better news at Art Hallow. Here is uh, the actual gun emplacement, 9.2 inch. Now, to give you an idea, that size of that wall there is about two and a half meters high. It is a really big thing. The, the bolts here, they're about this size. So again, this is a gun that could fire a shell 29,000 yards. So it has to be really well built. That survives pretty well. It's the gun emplacement's full intact. Unfortunately, the six inch guns, only the apron of the glasses, the sloping area of concrete in front of the gun itself is the only thing that remains. However, lying, being buried, purposely buried, behind that are the, mag the, uh, the subsurface magazines, crew quarters, uh, lamp room of all things, uh, and uh, stores. And that's actually been covered over and buried. So it's still there, it's just proper archeology, span it's underground. I also had uh, one of the, the, the boundary stones there as well. What does survive and really well is the battery observation post. And I apologise for the picture. This is it. It is impossible to photograph. It is completely surrounded by trees. Uh, but it's a, it's a three and a half storey structure. These are plans that we made on site. We took about a couple of days to produce these excellent plans. And we were able to disassemble the building, if you like, and produce phasing. So the first phase in the First World War is these black areas. Uh, and then as time goes on, more and more is built. And finally, the top room, which was the World War II battery observation post, is, is constructed. We always like buildings to be reused. Uh, here it is, uh, the top room. It's been used as a gang hut for the owner's uh, daughter and her friends. It's, uh, it's rather well appointed. Moving on to the best preserved of the batteries uh, for, uh, to date to that first phase is Port Kill Battery. Now, it had two sections gun emplacements. This is the plan that we took, uh, that we made uh, of the gun emplacements themselves. Uh, absolutely massive construction. Huge rooms underneath. Uh, you could descend by a flight of stairs down, uh, two, two stairs, uh, why not? Uh, two stairs down, crew shelter and quarters there. Uh, originally, they had beds in there. A lamp, uh, the Royal Engineers store. Uh, lamp room and then shell room leading through uh, a, a, a shifting lobby as it's called and into the magazine proper. So that's the crew shelter. So it's a really large, lots of windows, a couple of doors, obviously one for the officers. Uh, and then the interior of the magazine uh, with protected lamps, uh, which would originally have been a lamp on the outside of the, of the room uh, and a big glass 
covering that. Each one of these is numbered and the plates still uh, exist on the wall. And this is the shell room, this is this area here, uh, and you can see uh, that's where the lamp originally stood to light the magazine. And down there the ammunition was sent up to the top via lift shafts here and here. If we look at just the preservation across the whole of the battery, much of the battery survives from the guardhouse uh, to the engine room. This is the engine room here. Uh, it's actually underneath a modern building, so planning has uh, beautifully managed to, to, to allow building to occur but not to damage the uh, military uh, remains. This is the guardhouse or caretaker's cottage. Uh, and this section is the top of that lift that I was talking about. I've never seen one quite as good state of preservation, this timber. And I don't know if you can make out that sort of bottle shape. And that forced the shell, which was coming up on the lift, to then be pushed out of the entrance. And so it was easier for the men to manhandle. It's a beautiful piece of preservation. And we've drawn that in particular because of its preservation. That's the entrance to the crew shelters, a beautiful uh, engineering bricks, uh, white salt bricks. Everything's beautifully curved. This was built, obviously, not at a time of rush, so it, it's just beautifully done. Always look at our archives, because this is a picture of them actually transporting one of the guns up the hill uh, to the 4.7-inch emplacement. Uh, uh, it's called par buckling. So basically, it's manhandling, pulling, uh, pulling it up. Now, there is a 4.7-inch battery, very similar to the 6-inch battery, but we didn't survey that. And the reason we didn't survey that was actually people use it. People live in it. It's been used for the last 60 years, in one case, uh, by one family or three families occupying that area. And they use it for summer accommodation and at weekends. And it's in beautiful state of preservation. Uh, and the fires in it are very nice. And they vent out the original flues. So it's absolutely fantastic. Move on to Clock. Clock is perhaps the battery that's seen most development. It's got a massive ca uh, caravan site on it. Uh, and so the preservation on the site is not quite as good as the others. However, there's still elements that we have found of the original campsite buried in and amongst uh, the, the hillside. This is originally where the guns, the guns were stood on top of this drum just up here, but it's been covered and you can see the caravans. Uh, but there are a few buildings on the site. The Port War uh, Fire Command uh, station uh, is this. This was originally the First World War, which is this photograph here. And a Second World War extension was added on, on there, so it's on two slightly different levels. There's also a rather unusual building which appears to overlook the, uh, the boom and may have been for the submarine minefield that would have sat just outside the boom and all protected, uh, the boom itself protected by these searchlight houses, of which three, two are existing, uh, are upstanding. Uh, and one is just a shell, but you can uh, right beside the road, so you can visit them quite easily. They, what they did do was protect the boom. And sadly, I don't have a Second World War picture, but I have a First World War picture taken by a passing airship in about, about 1917, 1918, uh, and that shows uh, the, the boom, a very simple boom at this point, and here it is looking the other way with the gate and uh, the, the trawlers guarding it. Um, and that's searchlight, there's another searchlight over there, engine house, and just up here are the battery itself. Uh, and it was all accessed by a tramway which runs up the slope. Quite an amazing piece of engineering. And so I should have mentioned, uh, the Second World War boom was tethered here and here on either side of the lighthouse, and this is one of the anchor points, uh, and it's been, uh, it's, it's been a designated site, it's been scheduled as an ancient monument. <coughs> So finally, the last of the uh, uh, gun emplacements is the towered battery uh, down at the very south end. And it's entirely Second World War, constructed in 1940 as an emergency battery. And it comprises two guns, uh, which you can see, two gun houses there, the battery observation post. And it's really quite a striking sight. On visiting it, it pre pre presented a, a, a range of problems. Uh, the gun houses were very, very strange. We just couldn't get a handle on them. But when and this is what happens when you visit a building and you start to actually investigate and how it works, we began to realise that the buildings themselves were not a single phase of building, but they've actually been radically altered. Uh, and we discovered that the original gun pit extended much further out, hence it should have been a whole circle. But then they cut it off, 
put an additional roof in and all the rest, it suddenly became a much more uh, interesting site. It has the entire campsite with it. And walking over it, spending time looking at it, we'll really start to be able to record even the positions where there are wooden buildings. Uh, very, very slight undulations in the, in the landscape, which once you've got an eye in and you can understand what you're looking at, suddenly begin to tell you the story. It's, it's the, the essential point on doing field survey is you actually get a lot more data. So we've been able to recover almost the entire plan of the, the, the campsite, including lots of field defences and trenches and machine gun posts that surrounded it. But what we kind of half expected it, but the First World War also had those defences around it. Uh, using a range of techniques from LIDAR, uh, which is using lasers from, from airplanes, to, to again using traditional field skills, we've been able to record all the tr uh, trenches and uh, blockhouses as they were called, timber blockhouses surrounded by uh, a wall of sandbags uh, acting in effect as a pillbox. And we've been able to record these in a number of places. There, there are somewhere using about 15 of these blockhouses knocking about at Ardhallow and Portkill, designed to protect those batteries from attack. We've also found an extensive trench system at Fort Matilda on Lyle Hill, which is the Greenock Golf Course. And it's surviving a very slight where earthworks actually in the fairways. So that was, all, that was good fun, uh, uh, surveying those and watching the balls go over our head. Anyway, so you can see there's a trench there, there's a blockhouse, circular blockhouse feature. This was the best preserved on Gallo Hill, and you can just about make out the actual construction of it there. Uh, so fascinating uh, insight into these defences, and unique. Uh, they've not been recorded, have not been archaeologically recorded anywhere else in the UK. So maybe that's perhaps enough on the coastal defences. The aerial defences. This is a map of all our aerial sites. And as you can see, it's a, it's a very confusing map, but it's an extensive system. This was an entirely integrated system. Uh, so let's not dwell on that busy map, and let's start to break it down. This is the anti-aircraft guns, the heavy anti-aircraft guns. They're normally well visited. Lots of people understand them. And I'm sure many in the audience know all about them. Uh, and we can see they're quite large sites, generally four guns, command posts in the centre. But they also come with a large accommodation camp, sometimes up to 200 men and women stationed at each of these sites, the potentially at each of these sites. It is obvious from our archive research in the, in the National Archives that not all of those guns were in use at the same time. And some of the gun emplacements end up with six or eight guns uh, as time goes on, as the the requirements for the defence change. But it's an extensive system. And a, great, a good percentage of those actually survive. But we've been able to pick up differences in the nature of the, the layout of the emplacements, which has a uh, correlation with when they were actually built. So we're still in the middle of, of just firming up that one, so I don't want to dwell on that, uh, at that point particularly. But what's often missed out is the light anti-aircraft gun emplacements. Now, around vulnerable points, transportation, factories, and such like, they would also have their own protection, light anti-aircraft guns, machine guns, or bofers, 20 mil or 40 mil. And this is a, it's a site at Alexandria, just uh, south of Loch uh, Lomond, and you can see the barbed wire enclosure and a number of buildings inside. We've now visited most of these sites, and in two cases, we've actually got outstanding building. This in a farm at Bishopton, uh, to the west of Glasgow. Uh, it's got a pitch roof now, but originally it looked like this building here. This building is, is sadly gone. It's in Dumbarton, uh, and that's the gun emplacement for probably a, a, a 20 or 40 mil Bofors gun. Very difficult to find any of them, and our investigations have only found one site with anything approaching the remains. Uh, this for a, a twin Vickers machine gun, uh, again at Bishopton. So they're there. You just have to look and I look very carefully. Moving on, this is the thing that's kind of uh, surprised us. We knew searchlights existed, but we didn't know the size and extent. And as you can see, there are 125 dots on here. These were actual sites, they really did exist. Uh, and we can see one of these just in here. This is the searchlight itself, this is a big site. Most of, the most of those blue dots comprise just one 
uh, one searchlight. But this one seems to have three hats, and this is what we generally find on the site. Uh, there's a hat there with a couple of steps up to it, and another hat just, just in there. So not much remaining, and we haven't visited enough to determine if we can find any of the actual searchlights. But each of these would have a detachment, uh, mostly women. Uh, one man, his job apparently was to start the engine, uh, the generator. Uh, but in actual fact, that's not a bit of a misnomer. He was there to, to fire uh, a machine gun if a plane attacked, as the, uh, the women were not allowed to, to use the weapons. Um, moving on. It's like a concentric rings. Um, I should actually add, just before I do move on, the, uh, the searchlights not acting purely with the guns. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer, uh, not quite understood. But most of those searchlights are actually working with, uh, yes, with the guns in part, but also with the uh, night fighters that were flying around. And it was worked out a series of boxes. It gets, gets a bit complicated and anorakish, but it was a system and, and it, it, it worked some places in the UK. Right in the centre, right above the vulnerable points, uh, such as the shipyards at Greenock, uh, and down the Clyde and various industries of, of the Clyde, because obviously Glasgow was just a huge industrial centre, were barrage balloons. Here are a couple, just at to the west of, um, just over here, the, this group here. So there's one there and one there. Uh, hydrogen filled, had a tendency to go up in flames if there was any lightning around. Uh, but they could fly up to 5,000 feet and had to be incredibly well tethered down to the ground. And they were tethered down by using massive concrete blocks. You can see the iron rings here. We hope to find some of these iron rings and concrete blocks in situ. But in actual fact, at no site of the 136 sites that we've looked at, uh, of, and that's actually 16 more than was in the archives, uh, have we found a single site with anything actually in situ, which is a real shame. However, when we went to Glasgow Green, right in the centre of Glasgow, uh, and we went to this site in particular, not expecting to find very much, but when we got there, we, we got a feeling there was something there. So we got, we got our equipment out and we started to map. And after a while of being patient and trying to understand, uh, this is what we ended up with as the plan. A beautiful series of pits, pits which the concrete blocks have been ripped out of and taken away uh, and then have been filled in. But of course, the filling in has not been very good, it's not been compressed, and so it leaves a very shallow impression. And we were able to recover uh, virtually uh, most, of, except for the outer ring, all the anchor points. So quite a remarkable achievement just to get that. Now, all this is put in place to stop bombing. And um, I was asked if uh, I could have a little, if there was a project for a visiting student. So I said, yes, I've come up with a project. I came up with this. Look at all the uh, photographs that are held by, by us, uh, uh, National Collection of Aerial Photography, and try and look at them and try and recover all the bombs, uh, all bomb craters in and around the population centres. Clyde Bank here, obviously, uh, and... Port Glasgow Greenock suffered from uh, raids in March and May of 1941, devastating raids for those two towns. Uh, and the towns themselves, of all the bomb craters have all been, uh, were all marked up at the time, all the incendiaries and high explosive bombs. But no one bothered to look at what else was around. So my student, as he turned out to be German, uh, uh, set to and started to record all these. And uh, there is references to say that the bombing decoy sites on the hills above the towns did a good job. Well, in actual fact, they did a very good job. Dumbarton, there was, uh, that's a decoy site up there, and the decoy sites at the back here of Port Glasgow and Greenock, they certainly did their job. There are 508 high explosive bomb craters on this map. That's more than fell in the towns themselves. Um, so very extensive. Indeed, apart from poor Cardross, which seems to have got confused for Dumbarton and got heavily hit. That's not all the bomb craters. I'm sure that if we spent more time and I had a, 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 another, if I had Anna back, again, she would find many more uh, bomb craters. 
but it's certainly an indication of what, what we can use. And there, we're using archive that we hold and getting a, a fantastic story about what we're seeing. And here are the decoy sites uh, around. It was someone's job to set fire to these decoys. You set fire, it was like the planes would then travel to where, uh, it's like moths to a light, really. They would travel to those fires and drop the bombs in the fires. Pretty effective if you're trying to fly over some uh, pitch dark landscape. But uh, you would have two or three men in these little bunkers that would set fire to all the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the bla blazers and, and, uh, and oil pits that were, uh, and they were designed to look like a burning town, basically. Um, so the, all around the place. So that's the bunker, poor bunker, men in there, a bit close for comfort. Um, this, this is part of the site. There's another two concrete plinths on there, and that's where, the, that's where they would be, uh, and one bomb crater. So that guy did very well to bomb, bomb the decoy. So he did exactly what he was supposed to do. So well done him. Um, so that covers and We were surprised. We found one other thing we didn't expect. Um, as yet, I would like to tell you about ammo depots and headquarter buildings and gun operation rooms for the, the gun defence area, as it was called. But uh, we haven't got that far in the project yet. But what we did, we found one of these things you just you stumble upon and you don't expect. And it's these, mine watching uh, service uh, observation posts, all the way down the Clyde. We've got 10 so far, um, and they're very, very simple brick brick structures. And the job in there was two men, uh, or women, to uh, record where the bombs fell, or the mines had been dropped by aircraft into the shipping channels. So that was their job. That's where they sat, that's where they stood. A uh, guy called Buildings, uh, and uh, that was their job and watch the bombs fall all around. Uh, we have four at Bowling, which is just here at Erskine, uh, which were uncovered by the Connected to the Clyde project. And we've got stuff in Greenock uh, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, even one at Lamlash Bay on Arran. So we're extending our, 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 our area. So just to summarize, uh, we've done an awful lot of work. We have increased the number of sites into Canmore considerably, with the potential for a lot more to come as well as our, as our work draws to this conclusion. We have unique sites that have never been surveyed before, never been seen as an upstanding archaeological feature in the UK. So really big firsts for us, for our project, for survey and recording. And we've been able to work with other groups as well. We've worked with the Centre of Battlefield Archaeology at the Glasgow University, helping train their students at, at Towered uh, Battery, given the experience of surveying techniques. And we're also working with North Clyde Archaeological Society. To, uh, they've done a lot of work and survey of some of the gun batteries in that area, and we're working with them to make the record, uh, of the, the national record of the built environment, much better and, and, and improved. So at this point, I'm going to shut up and let Philip uh, get, show you some really nice pictures. Right. Thank you very much for that, Alan. And I'll just let Philip get properly mic'd up. Right, so next up we have Philip Robertson. And Philip has worked for Historic Environment Scotland and its predecessor organisation since 2004, and is a specialist in coastal and marine archaeology. Uh, Philip currently works for our designations team and is responsible for the provision of advice to the Scottish Government on historic marine protected areas. And I did not realise this, but before starting his career at Historic Environment Scotland, Philip and his family run a popular scuba diving, diving centre in the Sound of Mull. So you get some wonderful details when you ask people for bio details before you do these lectures. So uh, Philip's going to be talking to us this evening about the results of underwater surveys at Scapa Flow. So. So thanks to Kirsty for that kind introduction. I don't dive very much anymore. I did it for 10 years and absolutely loved it. Um, now we uh, actually have a diving contract, people who do our diving work for us, and I work very closely with them. So thanks to Kirsty for that kind introduction, and indeed to Alan for uh, giving you a glimpse of the Clyde and work on land. For my slot, I'm going to add a very salty perspective and take you up to Orkney to show you the marine archaeology of Scapa Flow. Orkney's location at the northern gateway from mainland Europe to the Atlantic meant that its seas have long been of strategic importance. My talk focuses on Orkney's key role in the Navy's attempts to control the waters of the North Sea and the North Atlantic. 
Chosen as a war station for the Grand Fleet during the First World War, it was from Scapa Flow that Admiral Jellicoe left in May 1916 before the Battle of Jutland, where the Royal Navy took on the German high seas fleet in the largest naval battle of the First World War, a battle which proved costly for both sides. Then, retained as the northern base for the home fleet in the Second World War, it was from Scapa Flow that HMS Hood left in May 1941 to intercept the German battleship Bismarck. Scapa also served as the base for the Arctic convoy escorts, one of the most dangerous naval operations of the Second War. Alan has already showed you the remains that exist on land around, and showed you in detail what exists around the Clyde. I wanted to add this, for this uh, map of, of what exists around our coasts. While the wars on land were fought on mainland Europe and beyond, the wars at sea were fought very close to home. This has left its mark in the substantial Royal Naval and submarine losses around our coasts. An obvious omission from this map is the substantial number of merchant ships lost to mines, submarines and surface raiders. Scapa Flow's suitability as a naval base owes much to its geography. It is a large, open body of water of around 120 square kilometres in area, sheltered by islands on all sides. At the beginning of the First World War, the Admiralty sought to strengthen its defences from seaborne attack, using an ingenious network of coastal batteries, barriers, block ships and mobile defences, and Alan's already introduced that for the Clyde and I will show you about what survives in more detail later. But first, a little bit of the context on land. At any one time, around 100,000 personnel were stationed at Scapa during the First War. Accommodation camps appear across the islands. Naval personnel, however, are generally accommodated on board their ships with downtime spent ashore. In addition to existing civilian facilities, purpose-built structures and facilities for entertainment, recreation and religious worship appear, particularly around Longhope and the island of Flotter. In the Second World War, Lyness on Hoy was the main shore base supporting the home fleet. And by 1940, around 12,000 military and civilian personnel were based here. It was decommissioned in March 1957, although the oil tank shown here um, is still there at Linus Visitor Centre today. These remained in use until 1976. The coastal batteries. Men here from the, from the Orkney Royal Ga Garrison Artillery are shown constructing nest battery outside Stromness. Coastal battery defences surround Scapa Flow and were further strengthened during the Second War to counter aerial threat. What about our role on land? Alan's talked a little bit about uh, what they've been doing in the Clyde, but what have we been doing up in Scapa Flow at sea? During the, first, the course of the First War Centenary, our teams have been busy recording and reviewing protection for, for all these sites on land. Um, but yes, this role extends offshore. And since um, around the 1990s, there's been growing appreciation of the extent of survival and interest of this underwater heritage. Our marine role has involved survey work using divers, um, shown here in the top left. We also work with public authorities, universities and industry using some of the latest offshore technology. The vessel on the bottom left there is using a, a high resolution acoustic sonar equipment, the kind of thing that we use for hydrography, for mapping the seabed. It's also very, very useful for mapping wrecks. The, thought boggle, the mind boggles to think how long it would to take to achieve that just <coughs> using divers underwater. We also work very closely with local community groups who are absolutely passionate, passionate about the heritage that exists in Scapa Flow. In 2001, Historic Scotland took the decision to schedule the wrecks of the German high seas fleet. And this is the same protection that we use for archaeology and land, recognising them as nationally important monuments. Since then, we've been very actively involved in monitoring and survey work, as well as education and interpretation initiatives to try and widen access. And I'd like to take some of this opportunity to showcase the results of our work and also 
the efforts of some of the groups with whom we collaborate. The first is the wreck of the HMS Hampshire. On the 5th of June 1916, the armoured battle cruiser HMS Hampshire hit a mine off Marrick Head, west of Orkney, carrying Lord Kitchener and his entourage to a meeting with Tsar Nicholas II. Only 12 of the 655 crew survived. The wreck of the Hampshire is a designated war grave, but in June 2016, a specialist diving team obtained permission from the Ministry of Defence to visit the wreck to help document it 100 years after its sinking. Operating at a depth which severely limits the amount of time that can be spent underwater safely, the team gathered photographs and video which have helped to generate this photo model of the wreck on the seabed. Here, divers are exploring the bow or front of the ship with its distinctive shape. Although relatively intact, the main impact of the mine and the damage resulting as the ship hit the seabed can be seen in this area. Here we see one of the ship's propellers, the diver providing a useful scale to help us understand the huge size of this wreck as she lies underwater. I move on now to HMS Vanguard, which survived the Battle of Jutland, but late at night on 9th of July 1917, while anchored in Scapa Flow, Vanguard was destroyed when cordite in one of the magazines exploded. The top right image shows Stoker Cox and Royal Marine Private Williams, the only survivors of the 845 men aboard at the time of the explosion. The force of which is evident in this photo mosaic below showing the exploded stern of the wreck from recent survey and the remains of the twin gun turrets. The wreck of the Vanguard is also a designated war grave and again permission was granted last year to allow documentation of the wreck. Photographs here showing the remains of the stern. At the centenary, the same team joined up with Royal Navy divers to document their dive to replace the white ensign on the wreck. The Royal Navy fleet in Scapa Flow required a major supply effort and close to the wreck of the Vanguard is that of the SS Prudentia, one of the Admiralty oilers responsible for refueling. She was wrecked in a collision in 1916. Located close to Flotter Oil Terminal, the wreck of the Prudentia survives very substantially intact. But it wasn't only the large vessels that supplied the fleet, it was vessels of all sizes that were crucial to the war effort. Her Majesty's Drifter, Chance, a wick registered herring drifter, was one of many such vessels used in Scapa Flow for mine sweeping, for towage, and general harbours work. We know of seven recorded losses, several of which have only been discovered very recently. In this case, with her wooden hull largely rotted away, Archaeologists have identified markings on her funnel, bottom right, showing the, reg the, the vessel's registered fishing number and confirming her identification. But what remains of the extensive efforts to defend Scapa Flow? The most obvious remains are the block ships, and those of you who have visited Orkney may have seen them yourselves. They were essentially redundant merchant ships used to block channels between the islands. Their failure to prevent submarine incursion through Kirk Sound in 1939 led to the construction of the Churchill Barriers, which now provide an important road link between mainland Orkney and South Ronaldsea. And for those of you who visit the Churchill Barriers today, um, the image here on the bottom left is one of the black ships, which is now very heavily um, in, grown up with sand. Indeed, you'd only see the concrete top uh, picking out of the sand, the rest of the, the ship is actually buried. There were also fixed barriers, and only visible to those who dive are the underwater remains of the so-called clestrine hurdles, the top two images, um, the hurdles in use and underwater today. They were a huge structure of metal frames with a large gate in the middle that was built across Clestrain Sound at the western entrance to Scapa Flow. The fixed frame here was required to withstand tidal currents in the area. Bottom left is at Rowan Head and is the remains of an anti 
to anti-torpedo close protection pontoon, which they put on the sides of ships to prevent torpedo attack. And the remains in the middle of the channel are the remains of discarded boom netting. Bottom right, of course, are the remains of other Churchill barriers themselves. But it's not only fixed barriers and mobile defense uh, and, and block ships. We also have mobile defenses. Um, Alan showed you the ones in the Clyde again. There was a big mobile defense, a big mobile boom in, in Hoxha in the southern end, entrance into Scapa Flow, here shown operating early in the First War. We've identified extensive remains on the seabed, both of the buoys and of the boom net, a very hazy black and white photograph taken from a remote operated vehicle, essentially a robot underwater. Um, the image bottom left is that of the Strath Gary, which was another converted trawler and she was operating the Hoxha boom when she sank in collision in July 1915. That image is a, a sort of sonar image. She's in quite deep water, but very substantially intact. What about the submarines? The only wreck of a German submarine with Scapa, within Scapa Flow is that of the UB-116. On 28th of October 1918, her crew attempted to enter Scapa Flow. She was detected in Hoxha Sound and destroyed when the minefields in the area were detonated. The remains of this wreck were substantially salvaged during the 1970s. And the image on the bottom left is essentially a map of what survives. Um, so it's very, very broken up. But there are identifiable features, such as top left, this photo mosaic of the, the Codding Tower remains. And the Of course, Scapa Flow remained vulnerable to submarine attack. And when Gunter Prien navigated his submarine U-47 at night and at high tide between the block ships in Kirk Sound to torpedo HMS Royal Oak with the loss of 834 men. Today, this wreck is also a designated war grave and is regularly monitored by the Ministry of Defence. Using the latest offshore sonar survey techniques in 2006 um, shows the Royal Oak as she lies on the seabed today. Today, the Royal Naval Salvage and Marine Operations team regularly visit her and maintain a watchful eye, particularly in order to monitor the risk of leakage of oil. There has been also, in quite recent times, a recent discovery of one of the Royal Oak's smaller pinnaces, the ships, the little boats that were carried on board have been discovered just off, off the side of the wreck. A particularly major focus for our team over the last number of years has been the wrecks of the German high seas fleet. The way we view these wrecks has changed immeasurably over the last hundred years. Once a weapon of mass destruction, 74 ships were interned in Scapa Flow under the armistice agreement in June 1919. Then in, no in June 1918. Then in November 1919, as negoti negotiations on the Treaty of Versailles drew to a close, Admiral von Reuter ordered his skeleton crews to scuttle the ships to avoid them falling into enemy hands. Most sank, but some were beached and recovered soon after. Eight German sailors were killed and five others wounded during the scuttling. From the 1920s to the 1970s, the German wrecks were subject to one of the greatest marine salvage feats of all time, as pioneers such as Arthur Cox and Thomas Mackenzie recovered the hulks for scrap metal, before others returned later on to target armoured plating and other large items from the remaining wrecks. Seven large wrecks proved too deep to salvage economically in one piece, and since the 1980s, they've become a popular tourist attraction, attracting 3,000 or so diving visitors every year to Scapa Flow. For those who don't dive, visit the Scapa Flow Visitor Centre to find out all about this very interesting part of Orkney's heritage. But the wrecks include three Koenig-class battleships. The image at the top is that of the Koenig-class battleship SMS Mark Graf. All the battleships here sank upside down. And you can see 
in the holes in the wreck some of the impacts of salvage activity in the 60s and 70s. There are also four cruisers. They all sank on their sides. And again, they've been heavily salvaged, but remain substantially intact. The image bottom left is that of a diver exploring the remains of the wreck. Some divers explore inside the compartments and tell us about what survives. Very brave indeed. Um, they're not just ferrous skeletons, they are full of the social history of the day of, for example, on the right hand side, this collection of sailors' postcards, which were recovered in 2003 and conserved, and they're um, stored in Orkney archives in Kirkwall and available to view. The seven wrecks that survive are, also, are not all that is there. The, the bottom middle image is the remains of the salvage um, that took place in the 20s and 30s. When they were trying to recover the battleship Bayern in uh, 1926, I believe, sorry, June, July 1923, Initially, she developed a severe list and had to be resunk before the successful refloating. She left four 600 ton gun turrets behind on the seabed. But you can also see the indentations that she's left behind, two of them because of the need to resink her and then refloat her again. As my talk comes to an end, I thought I would just conclude by um, these photographs of memorials at Lioness Cemetery on Hoy and at Marek Head Bursay, which remind us all of the, all those who lost their lives in these incidents in the service of both their countries, for Lioness Cemetery of course has both German and British sailors during the two world wars of the 20th century. Thank you. This is where I fight with the microphone. Uh, could I invite our two speakers back up to the front? And I'm just going to wait on my cue from the back, and then we should be able to take a few questions. I can just overcome. <laughs> Okay, does anybody have any questions for our speakers? Okay, gentleman down at the front. The map that we were shown right at the beginning of the whole of Scotland with numerous military sites, are those military sites from every period or particularly those those are all just 20th century military sites so uh, you could th th well there's an awful lot of 18th 19th century military, and you could go further and further back into castles my goodness you're just into the wealth yes. of of the heritage of scotland and i'd like to ask one supplementary question there was a dot right out to the north, north rona i knew someone was going to pick up on that well done <laughs> well, uh, I, I thought it was soul skier but it's it's north rona it's north rona yes what it, is the, uh, the north the, rona? well uh north rona is quite interesting i could have it could refer to uh, the seven sheep that were stolen by a German submarine in 1918 <laughs> but it doesn't uh, it actually uh, there's a, a military uh, aircraft crash landed uh, probably a very fortunate crash land uh, to find the only piece of land for miles around but that's what it's it's, it's a, a, a aircraft crash site so it's not an installation it's not an installation it isn't it yes I, I, I kept that one purely because yeah. I thought it might be nice <laughs> thank you okay uh, next question down here at the front um, bomb crater survey, were you aware the Royal Engineers keep a, a record of all known bomb sites where the bombs are still there? Um, yes, I did, <coughs> but we haven't, we haven't uh, engaged in that. It, this was really just uh, an exercise to, to, for, a, for a student to, to, to get an idea of resources and how to use it. Um, there wasn't time to, to go in and, dwell and delve into other sites. I mean, there are... Um, the, the work down at uh, near Strand Ra with the bomb disposal teams have been working mm. in the moorland up there for years, which was a bombing training ground and fake factory yeah. and all the rest, uh, concrete walls to shoot at. Uh, they've been taking 
bombs out of there for years. Uh, yeah. But uh, no, we didn't have time to, to, to look at that. It's, uh, uh, it's something that is yeah. worth, and if I was allowed more time, then I, I could probably do that. It's, it's probably a good thing you don't, because <laughs> clearly they're still full of explosives, and well, th these it, are the unexploded as, bombs, as you can of course. See from, from some of these, some of these yeah. areas, people may not have thought there's many explosives, but in the moors above, uh, above Greenock at the moment, I know there's, there's uh, an application for wind farm development. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would hope they would they would do something to yeah. find out if there's any <laughs> exploded bombs before they start. They, they, they can ask for a survey. Yeah, they can uh, ask for so survey. Yeah. And so it's yeah. another layer of information yeah. for for these. And all those all those bomb craters are all recorded uh, uh, on on our maps uh, and our, as, a, as a specific layer within GIS, uh, so that it's available for for people who want to uh, download of those those areas. And you can go bomb hunting. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, gentlemen down here at the front in the black. Yeah, so I've, annoyingly I've got two questions, but if you'll bear with me, they are albeit tangentially linked. Um, you said you said that these sites were 20th century sites. I wondered to what extent there was reuse of sites that you, that, that had historical elements to them. So there was bits of geography that were there were there, um, particularly around the Clyde Estuary that, that yeah, were being I reused. Mean, and, and I'll ask the second part, okay. just so you can answer them together, because it might work. Um, is that to to uh, to what we saw in the in the first image you showed of, of the Clyde that there was a migration of gun uh, placements south? Yes. Just why was that? Um, okay. the the obvious The obvious answer is Fort Matilda, which is built in 1815 as an artillery fortification. It replaces Fort Gervais uh, just up Greenock itself, and they moved the defences a bit further out of Greenock. Um, the rest of the defences are all are all new, um, uh, so that during uh, the First World War, when they realised, well, when the, when the war started, there were no boom defences. That was not something that w the anti-submarine booms did did not exist, uh, and it was uh, a Captain Munro uh, at the Cromarty Firth who um, instigated um, the design of the boom, which was uh, well, he he, he was he was. He was given a good dressing down for, for, for building one of these things without permission, and he was a very naughty boy. But every single anchorage within the year had one of these, so, and he got promoted and went to Scapa Flow, actually. Um, and so they, they decided the best place to put the boom was across at uh, the tail of the bank at, between Clough and Dunoon. So therefore, Port Kill and Fort Matilda really didn't become a very good position, so they had to move those guns further south. So I hope that answers submarines. But also, I mean, connected to that, there was uh, a submarine minefield immediately in front of the boom, uh, and also there was the, uh, I've forgotten the phrase, the, the hydrographic, the listening out posts uh, all the way down the Clyde uh, as well. Okay, a gentleman just up here. I could more of a, a statement actually following on from the uh, other question that's just come in terms of the hydro booms i don't know if you guys are aware on flotter in terms of what you talked about the submarine that went up there's actually the hydro boom actual shed is still there it's actually been reused back to the the question that the gentleman has just raised and it's now part of a farmhouse and it's got its own little museum inside it so that's actually on flutter itself just leading on to that piece so it's leading on again in terms of Scapa, so there is a question coming. Th that's right, th there are such extensive remains everywhere, yeah. and I've, I have visited some of the remains on the Flotter, but not those, actually, so the next time I go, that would be really I'm sure you'd get a, a cup of tea if you Thank visited, you. I did. That's <laughs> <laughs> Alan, is that something you're aware of? Um, uh, yes, I'm aware uh, of, of that, yes. Um, I, and, and just to comment on the sheer wealth, everything that you saw in the aerial defence is repeated. Up in up in Orkney, Absolutely. the barrage balloons sites, however, are still ex fully extant, so you can actually see what they look like actually on physically on the ground. So it's 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 a marvelous landscape. It's a landscape I've I've only touched by a little tiny little bit. Spent two days in Orkney uh, with my parents and I didn't see very much Churchill barriers, but you kind of have to drive over those anyway. Uh, so it's a wealth of of material, uh, and and both First and Second World War, the preservation of the First World War remains is is as good, if not better, than, than almost anywhere else in the UK. It's, it's, it's a fantastic la military landscape, both maritime and land. That's awesome. So the, the question's leading on to Orkney again. 21st of June, 1919, anniversary obviously coming up. 
Um, what we got planned for that? Is there anything that you guys are intending on doing within uh, the realms of it? To to commemorate the high seas fleet. Yeah. Yes. Um, there there are plans um, within Scottish government and also at UK level um, over the course of the centenary. We've obviously had Jutland commemorations, Hampshire commemorations, and we're um, underway with planning for um, the scuttling of the high seas fleet. There are locally driven initiatives, so there's a project called SCAPA 100, which is beginning to corral community effort. And uh, we have our own work going on. We're beginning to think a little bit about uh, additional archiving, a copying of plans, making um, some of the film available from the scuttling of the high seas fleet and the salvaging of the high seas fleet with the Imperial War Museum. Think a bit about more about protection of other sites in Scapa Flow, other other sites that there that need protection. If so, what is the best mechanism? Having a, 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 also planning a big discussion with the community on Orkney about that because Scapa Flow remains a very important place today. But yes, there'll be a lot going on in, in during that centenary, I'm sure. Okay, thank you very much. Mm. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, just one more down here at the front before you run off with the microphone, Santi. <laughs> uh, just one on the flow. Um, with the nature of the wrecks, what do we estimate the timescale is until these things are yeah. no longer um, really visible for, for divers? Or yeah, <coughs> excuse my, my voice is going. Um, we've done periodic surveys using sonar. Um, we did a first survey in 2001, a follow-up survey in 2006, and we've just this summer done a follow-up survey again, which gives us, I suppose, three comparable data sets with which we can begin to understand the um, decay, the decay process. Um, and the Ministry of Defense also did some sampling work, taking some hull samples from one of the German high seas fleet wrecks to understand the degree of corrosion of the structures. Um, so at the moment we can say, yes, they are deteriorating. That's backed up by the observations of divers who visit them every year and say, you know, this has collapsed since they've last been there. So there's the sort of anecdotal um, qualitative data and quantitative data, we're not quite there yet. Um, this is a, obviously a common picture worldwide and other scientists, archaeologists from across the world might say we can measure their survival in many decades, um, maybe into hundreds of years, but it will be a gradual process mm -hmm. of decay and collapse. Exactly what that looks like, we're not quite sure yet, and it requires further study. Um, but it's not to say that they'll be gone tomorrow. Um, they are. It's a gradual process. Um, in the case of the German high seas fleet, obviously the fact that they've been opened up through salvage is likely to exacerbate that situation. Yeah. So will we be celebrating the 200 year? In memory, <laughs> at least. <laughs> I was going to say, given the cannons seem to last for a long time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, we're with, yeah. with some of our other sites, we're dealing with 17th century remains. Mm -hmm. Uh, cannons, as you say, metal material which forms concretion. Yeah. Um, obviously, there are protective layers around metal, and that decay curve slows down. Exactly what that looks like with these, I don't know. Um, other materials should survive in, you know, if they're if they're buried for very long periods of time. So, heather on a 17th century wreck in the bilges has survived beautifully. Oak leaves that yeah. I've come up with, beautifully preserved. So. It's dependent on materials, depends on burial conditions, and dependent on what goes on in the intervening period. Right, so on that note, uh, if everybody would like to join me in thanking our two fantastic speakers for tonight. Thank you.